Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the new screensavers is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. The new screensavers is brought to you by Hover. Register a domain name with Hover and build your online brand today. Go to hover.com slash twit and save 10% off your first purchase. Welcome to the jungle. California takes on the FCC and open source is almost old enough to drink. Live from the Twit Eastside Studios in beautiful Petaluma, it's the new Screensavers! Wow, wasn't that great? That was great. That was Andrew Shaman, who is uh, who streams on Facebook Live. I thought for a minute ZZ Top was here, <laughs> briefly. John briefly. Lennon? Uh, this, <laughs> or John Lennon. This is episode 142, recorded Saturday, February 3rd, 2018. I'm Leo Laporte. And I'm Florence Ion. Love having old, fl old that flow in studio you with us. You call me old flow. It's old fine. Flow. Old love flow's it. here. <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, host of All About Android, uh, Woman About Town. I'll try. And uh, always a pleasure to have you on. The, Thank you for the having me, Leo. Thank always. you for coming. Thank you for being here. Um, let's see. We have a big show today coming up in just a bit. This is. I'm really excited about this. We actually pre-recorded this interview. You could see the ruins under the trees in the Guatemalan forest. Archaeologist T Thomas Garrison, a National Geographic explorer, and his team used lidar to scan the forest. He will tell us how it all worked. Very exciting. That's exciting. And California is taking on net neutrality and uh, kind of bumming out the FCC. We're going to have Denise Howell on the line to help us sort of figure, parse all this out. What's going on? We're very excited about that. Did you know also birthday today, 20th, today, 20th anniversary of open source. Joining us, Simon Phipps. He's at FOSDEM in Brussels, the big open source conference, to share the joy the joy of the 20th birthday and Megan Roney is going to join us a little bit later to kind of help us figure out how to buy a keyboard for the iPad. Now you're not an Apple, you're a Android person. No, but I, I know what it's like to try and find a keyboard for your tablet. Yes, yes. It's a little hard work. Yes, same problem. Yeah. You don't have an Apple watch either probably. I don't, do you have a, no. do, you have a, do you wear an Android Wear watch? No, I wear a hybrid watch. Oh. Yeah. Well, here's a watch coming up. That This is an Apple watch. It's an Apple watch not knockoff, but Father Robert had some nice things to say about it. The We Loop it's got a terrible name. We Loop. Hey, We Loop. Yes, GPS smartwatch. <laughs> and then it's a call for help. We're going to help you consolidate your photos and, of course, answer questions uh, too. But before we do that, let's talk about the hot topics. Super hot. Hot topics. In of fuego. The week. And actually, most of it was quarterly results. I, I didn't, I'm kind of thinking about this. What? In fuego. On oh, fire. <laughs> <laughs> Took me a while. I kind of. <laughs> And what did she just say? I thought I, I thought you said something mean. To me. No. Uh, <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> uh, what was I saying? Oh, quarterly results. This is uh, February, early February. So all of the companies reporting their results yes. ending in December. Yep. Uh, Alphabet, Google slash yes. Alphabet, Apple, Microsoft, eBay, Lenovo. I can go on and on. Uh, highlights. I think one of the things that was obvious is because of the new tax bill that passed towards the end of 2017, a lot of these companies are now taking advantage of the new tax rate, 15% tax rate for repatriation, yep. and bringing their funds back. But what they're seeing is big losses for the last quarter to do that. Google, for instance, I think it was $9.9 .9 billion. Billion dollars. Billions. Yeah. Nine point Less .9 billion than it would have been if they wouldn't have paid. I. Uh, they even said they would have had more earnings if it were not for that tricky little tax bill. A couple which... of companies lost money, eBay, yeah. Lenovo, because of the tax yep. bill. But in the long run, I think they're going to get money back. That's oh, yeah, the, of that's course. That's the big deal. Of course. So Alphabet, Google, it's really Google that's making all the money, right? But they don't. But they don't want. They can't. Right. No, mm -hmm. Alphabet mm -hmm. is the. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the thinkers. 
Uh, Alphabet had 24% growth in, uh, was that revenue? Revenue, I yeah. think. Yeah. Profit was also up. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. Any any like surprises or bottom line stuff in the alphabet results? Well, you know, I was bruising around the internet as one does uh, who works on the internet, and um, <laughs> you got a job. You I mean, you know, I gotta nice. I gotta do it. Uh, I did hear I read some rumblings about the fact that uh, the Google Play Store actually made a little more, re or rather, the downloads were a little bit higher than the iTunes Store. But interesting thing to note is a lot of Google's downloads because they come from emerging markets. Uh, they're not making as much money because. Apps don't cost as much money yeah. overseas as they do here. Yeah. So Apple is making revenue, but it's making revenue off Google. of Google. Or well, in oh, comparison, you're about Apple. in comparison oh, I see. to Apple, Got it. they're making revenue, but their revenue is a little higher in the sense that per dollar, they're they're doing more dollars right. because of the markets that they're getting most money from. So I just think it's interesting to look at that long term. We talk a lot about Google, Android being like this big player, but we have to remember where are they big players in the United States? It's still. I'd say it's still apples. The the, the the kind of the the truism everybody always assumed is that Apple users will pay for stuff. Abs yes. And Android <laughs> users are cheapskates. Well, we're not. We're economical. Some of us, you know. <laughs> Frugal. Well, not necessarily. I mean, I still dumped 700 bucks on a Pixel 2. That's true. I mean. The phones are not cheap anymore. They're not. Yeah. But $700 in comparison to what you'd get for $400 more. Right. Same camera hardware right. or rather comparable camera hardware. I think hardware. better, frankly, than yeah, the Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. of course I would say that. But mostly because of the software. <laughs> it's, not the, it's not the lens. It's yeah. the software, yeah. Uh, Google, uh, let's see, did lose money because of that big $9.9 yeah. $9 billion dollar. Uh, tax bill, but that's I I think that that's not really it's losing not, money. No, it's not. You're spending money to get money in comparison. Yeah. And thank you for paying taxes. We really cost, appreciate it. Cost per click, which has been declining for the past few years. Yeah. Declined 16 percent on Google websites, 7 percent on network uh, websites. The cost per click. So that's not good long term. In fact, the stock market thought Google perhaps was showing kind of some weakness. Um, paid hmm. clicks. Uh, grew by 48% on Google sites, 13% on network member sites. So ad revenues did go up 23.7% during the quarter. YouTube, big, big money. One and a half billion viewers. Yeah. They and... viewed on average 60 minutes a day on mobile and tablets. More than half YouTube's consumption. The new generation. On mobile. Mobile yep. and tablets. Yep. That's yep. where... That's where the new gen of users, that's the majority of their usage is on their smartphones. How are you watching TV these days? On your smartphone. How are you tuning into YouTube? On your smartphone. Meanwhile, Apple had its, and this is becoming kind of a, almost a broken record, its record quarter, most revenue ever, uh, most uh, profit ever. <laughs> <laughs> but not all, all. Look at that, seventy percent. You know what? Good for them. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> Good for knock it. you. Seventy percent from iPhone. These are the great <laughs> graphs that Jason Snell does every yeah. year at SixColors.com. Seventy percent of Apple's revenue for the quarter ending in December. It's Apple's first quarter because their fiscal year is different than the calendar right. year. Uh, seventy percent from the iPhone. Seven percent from the iPad. Uh, a little more. Eight percent from the Mac. But look at that purple wedge. That's wow. services. That's Apple Music. I was going to say, that's Apple Music. And the App Store that you were talking that's about. That's true. 10% of the overall revenue, and Apple says it's going to go up and up and up. Oh, oh definitely. The more business. they build that ecosystem, and Apple Music, too, has such a, has such just a clout about it. You know, right. Apple's always had this sort of clout in the music world anyway. So I really see them playing that up. $88 billion in revenue. They almost, they almost generated $30 billion a month. And the profit, uh, you know, a measly twenty billion dollars. A measly, in three months. a measly, <laughs> and that's after all the tax hits and everything. Twenty, they just they're just printing money over at Apple. It's kind of an amazing must uh, be nice. story. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it, a little softness in iPhone sales. Now, this was one thing we were watching very carefully yeah. because there had been lots of rumors. I think most of them uh, generated by short sellers. <laughs> frankly, oh. trying to yeah, trying to make money on Apple stock. Lots of rumors that the iPhone 10 was a disappointment. Uh, yes. But Tim Cook said on the analyst call, the iPhone 10 is still their best seller, has been ever since it was released. Yes, iPhone sales down a little bit, 1%. 
Not a huge amount. So they're ramping back production a little bit. That's probably more economical Maybe. for them in the long Maybe. run. It's, they hard, don't, it's you know. hard to say if they're ramping it back or not. I mean, that's that's the story coming out of the right. supply chain. Right. But this happens every year. Apple, every year, uh, to, to prime the pump, orders a ton of stuff holiday season and yeah for the holiday season yeah. and then and then slows it down once they've got the pipeline filled so every I don't retailer think does around this time it happens too. every single yeah. quarter, uh, every single year i don't think that's a big deal one thing that we did see is revenues from the iphone went up because the price yeah. went up so they made more money uh, than they ever that's had right before. commission i'm assuming commissions are higher on that hardware probably doesn't cost yep. that much more that's right than the iphone 8 <laughs> this is the one number I thought was very interesting. Apple now claims an installed base of 1.3 billion devices. That mm. is Android level. That's, that's Android almost level. Android. That's Android level. Yeah. That's a big deal. That's, no kidding. That's a portion of the world's population. <laughs> yeah. What are there, how many people are there on the planet? Four seven, million? Eight, seven eight or eight. Million? When We've did that happen? A, seven or eight. You guys got to slow down. That's yeah, ridiculous. <laughs> 30% growth in the Apple devices over the last two years. So uh, Apple train is still uh, full of steam and heading straight at you. Let's see, what else? Oh, this this I thought was really annoying. Now that we said all the good news from Apple. <laughs> Telegram, which is a really nice messaging app. It's the one that uh, Iran banned because it was being used right. by revolutionaries or protesters, not even revolutionaries, protesters in Iran. Telegram released a new version of their app on iOS called Telegram X. Well, they tried to release it on mm -hmm. iOS. They were able to get it out the door on Android. I like it. It's fast, mm -hmm. smooth. It was actually developed, I think, by a fan using the Telegram API. Yeah. And Telegram said, this is great. Good job. Made it their official uh, application. Tried to push it out on Apple. And it's like Apple had been asleep. And they went, what? Huh? Whoa, wait a minute. You can't put that on the Apple Store. That oh, dude, don't take my beer. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> don't, what? What? Because this is not any different, by the way. Same capabilities as previous versions yeah, of Telegram. Yeah. But Apple wouldn't let it on the store because you can get adult content on Telegram. Uh, what? Adult what, content. What? Inappropriate content. <laughs> um, Apple, this is the tweet from Pavel Durov, the founder of Telegram. We were alerted, he's Russian, we were alerted by Apple that inappropriate content was made available to our users and both apps were taken off the App Store. Once we have protections in place, we expect the apps to be back. Apple requires that if it's possible to get adult content on an app, that you A, say it is, and B, have a switch that All says right. hide that. And and I think this comes from some bots. There's bots. You know, there's lots of bots on Telegram. It's one of the things I like about Telegram. You and I could message. There's oh, some yes. question about whether there's secure messaging. Right. But that's not the problem. It's that you could subscribe to bots. There's a classical music bot. I subscribe to that. It'll send you classical music. There's bots for animated GIFs, of course. But there's also bots that will send you, apparently, adult pictures or videos or something. Bad content, bad, bad content. You know how Apple feels about that. So they woke up, because this has always been part of the Telegram platform, and uh, and said, no, you fix that. So I guess they'll fix that. Finally, 1989, young guy named Tim Berners, a <laughs> physicist. He wasn't young. But anyway, I like the story. He's a young guy, young guy, starting out, just starting out in physics. He had himself one of them next cubes, you're probably too young to remember those. They were beautiful. That's when my dad worked at Apple. Did he work for Apple? Yeah, 1988. So when Steve Jobs was fired, yeah. uh, he said, mm, and he started a yes, new computer company mm, called Next, right? Right. His next thing. And uh, made these beautiful cubes, made a whole new operating system, which became the foundation for OS X. Right. And Tim Berners-Lee, being a young physicist, there it is, had beautiful one box. of these. And he had a goal, he had an aim, he had a desire in 1989 to make it possible for other physicists at CERN, the Particle Research right. Lab in, in Switzerland, to share their uh, papers with one another and to, and this was the innovation, mark them up to do annotations. The original track change. Yeah. Yeah, actually <laughs> kind of is. So he created the first website, and it's back up, ladies and gentlemen. If you go to, look at that. Look at that nostalgia. That's how it used to look, kids. Right there. If, <laughs> isn't that awesome? We still had these in my gen when we were discovering the internet. Did you really? We still had this Info kind of Info.cern.ch. They just put it back online, the world's first website. And by the way, that's about a 300 baud modem. You wouldn't remember those either. But no. That's about the speed that was... That 
Yeah, that's when cool people had the internet. <laughs> <laughs> when the internet was cool, before AOLers showed up. Before the millennials were going to all yeah. of it. Anyway, it's kind of fun <laughs> to look at. You can actually uh, use it. Yeah. You can browse uh, documents and stuff like that. That's what the web. Kids? That's the pre-Google Doc, before back, the Google Doc. Back in 1989, that was what we called the World Wide Web. It's not that long ago. It really isn't in comparison. Were you born in 1989? I was, three years of age. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Be honest. <laughs> no, that's fine. You're young. I'm jealous. Uh, but that's uh, that was when the web started. And uh, it's not even that old, really. It's just a little it older than Flo. A little younger than Flo. All right. That's the hot talk. Oh, you know what we've got to do now? What do we have Denise to do Denise Howell. Now? Yes. Denise Howell is the host of This Week in Law on the Twit Network. She's a, a trained professional attorney and uh, an expert in internet, inter, uh, intellectual property law and a, a, a smart person and a, uh, a great thinker. And we thought we would have her come on and explain what's going on. And you may have read, of course, last year, the FCC, Ajit Pai. Mm -hmm. He got in as uh, chairman of the FCC and he said, no more net neutrality. Bad idea. Uh, threw it out. In fact, not only did he throw it out, but the commissioners voted three to two along party lines to also prohibit states from enacting any net neutrality laws of their own. <sighs> Sigh. Well, that didn't stop Montana, then New York State, and now California from creating their own net neutrality regulations. On the line with us, Denise Howell from This Week in Law. Hi, Denise. Hi, Denise. Hi. How are you, Leo? Ooh, Great like, to see you. I like your choker. I was is just a, thinking that's that the nice? same thing. It's a nice choker. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So so glad the choker came back, right? It was gone <laughs> and Seriously. <laughs> it looks like an Indian dream catcher or something oh, like yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Oh, I got it in Laguna Beach. You know, they're full of all kinds Lots of, of oh, yes. unbeaded things. Yes. yes. So um, the states of Montana and New York did it a little differently. Their governors issued an executive order yeah. that said, we as a state won't do business with any, you know, won't give you any government contracts with any ISPs that don't agree to protect the net, an open net. California is not doing that though, or are they? Well, I mean, that's part of what California wants to do, but California is going further than that. California also just wants to enact a version of the net neutrality rules that were impealed. So, so not only does California not want to do business with its state-run entities with ISPs that are not committing to net neutrality, but they don't want those ISPs to be able to do business with Californians Right in on. <laughs> right, right on. And by the way, I mean, I mean this is an it, one of the reasons I'm sure FCC will not like this and probably will do something about it is it really is an interstate commerce issue. I mean, yep. there's no company or few companies that only operate in California. Yep. So I I think of Comcast, the biggest internet yeah. service provider in the nation. Are they does this mean that they they would have to be open in in, in California but not in the rest of the country? Well, I mean that's you know, how I think of it is, uh, if you think about what's going on in Washington, D.C. as a conventional chessboard that the net neutrality game is playing out on, what California and all the states are doing now is introducing a sort of Star Trekian kind of three-dimensional chess with multiple boards uh, where <laughs> this is going to play out on a number of levels. Um, so... Your move, California, California is making a pretty bold move, um, taking on the interstate commerce clause, as you pointed out, saying, uh, we think that we have enough authority over our local business operations to survive an interstate, interstate commerce clause challenge. And we think we have local California laws that deal with things like unfair business practices yeah. and contracts, et cetera, et cetera, that we have an interest in enforcing. So they're taking a flyer on it uh, that way, a, pre a pretty bold flyer on it. And we'll see uh, what the chess move in response is. Of course, we know that one of the moves is going to be, hey, you know, you don't get more interstate commerce like than the internet. Um, so we'll we'll have to see how those arguments play out. 
uh, California could have taken a more conservative approach and the EFF and uh, one of their lawyers, Ernesto Falcone, if I'm saying his name correctly, Mm -hmm. uh, recommended a more conservative approach that, that focused only on things within the state. Because despite the interstate commerce clause, Uh, we do have provisions of law that allow the states to govern uh, intrastate, that means within the state, communications issues. Ah. So uh, what the the EFF would like to have seen is not quite such a bold uh, move on the three-dimensional chessboard, but something uh, that dealt with, say, for example, state provided subsidies to ISPs that you could only be eligible for those uh, if you were complying with net neutrality principles. Uh, The EFF has also raised the 4 million utility poles that ISPs access to deploy their networks in California. And then lastly, the franchise negotiations that each city does with local cable companies to allow those companies to operate oh. and serve those cities. So there are, there are all kinds of moves on this three-dimensional chessboard. California uh, has taken a pretty um, bold Impressive. one. Yeah. Uh, Senator State Senator Kevin DeLeon of Los Angeles is saying, hey, you know, we know there's an interstate commerce clause, but we've consulted with experts at Stanford and Berkeley and we know about what the EFF is saying, but we, we think we're on solid ground here. So they're taking a flyer on it. Is that going to create like a sort of fragmentation around the country, though? I wonder about that because I feel like that is a thing that happens in the United States is that we make laws that apply to certain states and then it ends up becoming this sort of weird like fragmentation among the country where you can do this in this state, this in this state. And I wonder how that would affect our Internet usage as sort of like a, a whole public. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure that that is one of the arguments that will be advanced in challenging this on interstate yeah. commerce clause grounds. Uh, as a practical matter, uh, there are plenty of areas where states like California and New York uh, legislate in ways that affect the way companies have to deal with everyone as right. a practical well, matter. Well, I think right? of emissions because, controls. Yeah. California is mm-hmm. very aggressive in emissions control, and that changed the entire country, how uh, ca- uh, car operators, uh, car manufacturers dealt with it. Right. Are, is, right. The, is the Montana or New York State approach, is that more tenable? Uh, well, that's that's the approach of saying, hey, if you're going to do business with our state entities, then we're going to put some conditions on uh, how that works. And I think that the EFF would probably argue that it's more tenable, but but not squarely within. Right. The, the EFF wants to play it safe and enact something mm. that's actually going to pass muster, um, that, that they think has a better chance. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it would. It's probably a safer play, Leo, but but not as safe as you could be. Does is is there this sort of sense of? Um, you know, maybe because Silicon Valley is based here in California, that like maybe this is why this is so much more heavy handed from this particular state versus like Montana, which is a lot s- smaller population, or New York, which may- maybe isn't as concentrated in this like tech world the way California is. Don't tell a New Yorker that. Sorry, New York. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I, don't know, I don't know that that really comes into play or not. Um, Really, I mean, you get a, you've got a whole host of states that that want to enact something. Twenty one states are that's suing. True. Right? That's true. Yeah, a that's true. A bunch of states are suing. So, and it's, this strikes me more as a uh, gesture than ex- anything that could actually yeah. survive a challenge in the courts. I'm sure the ISPs will immediately challenge uh, any any bill in uh, in court as soon as it becomes a law. Of course. And I would imagine. I mean, the Supreme Court has been very liberal in, in interpreting the uh, the Commerce Clause. I would imagine. It wouldn't even be a question. The Supreme Court would say, you can't do that. I don't know. I mean, you and I sitting here today breathing impact interstate commerce, right? Interstate True. commerce doesn't Everything exist is. without us doing that. Yeah. And and I think it's just a question of where you draw the line on. And, you know, certainly some powers are reserved to the states. So it's one of those federalism questions that are age old and have been playing out in our country since its inception. Every time uh, we talk yeah. about net neutrality, 
I get tweets from people who have been clearly uh, uh, swallowing the Fox News talking points whole, who says, well, you didn't have net neutrality until last year. What do you care about it now? And I just want to say the net has always been neutral, that there yeah. were, were many regulations on net neutrality, which the FCC had from time to time enforced against AT&T and others. Mm -hmm. But the problem was that AT&T and Verizon sued and uh, the court overturned it saying the FCC doesn't have the right to do this unless they turn on Title II, they call internet service providers common carriers, and then they can regulate it. The FCC, after a long debate, you may remember, we petitioned uh, the FCC. and we didn't, we didn't think that uh, we would get our way, but it turned out that uh, the FCC maybe was a little bit uh, influenced by all of those comments, and they said, yeah, all right, well, we're going to use Title II regulation. We'll use light-handed regulation, but if the courts say this is the only way we can do it, well, then we'll do it. But it was not the first time net neutrality was protected by the FCC. It has yeah. always been. The net was born open and free. This is something new. This is not something that we had, you know, we, we've always had protections for net neutrality. I'm sad to say that we're, we've lost them now. Um, and so, something else not to lose sight of is the fact that it's not just at the state level, but also at the municipal level. Uh, San Francisco is trying to find network providers that will provide citywide gigabit fiber right. internet service. Right. And the, one of the specs in the request for providers to come in and make bids is that that service has to be net neutral. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's not just going to be the states so trying to So clearly we're going to be in courts. We're going to be fighting all of this. Does the current FCC rule apply until such time as these court battles are over? Yes, okay. it does. It's not gonna. It's not frozen or or otherwise not in effect until mm -hmm. a court says so. Okay. So. So it's the opposite, in fact. Uh, that, that that's the law of the land right now, mm -hmm. and everybody else is trying to do otherwise. Right. Um, I love it that the FCC calls it restoring internet freedom. Yeah, that's that's exactly what should be said. That's the kind of vernacular well, we should be using. No, but that's the how, problem. How Washington, D.C. is that? <laughs> that's That means restoring the freedom of AT&T, oh. Verizon, Comcast. And well, see, then that's just misleading <laughs> to me. To make more money it's on our backs. just misleading me. Yeah. Uh, what, you know, do, what, Denise, I mean, we, we brought you in for the legal advice, and thank you for kind of clarifying what's going on. Sure. Is there any hope? What can, what can yeah. us mortals do? Obviously, commenting to the FCC had no effect this time around. Not at all. We were able to persuade Thomas Wheeler to change his mind, but no, no effect on Ajit Pai. He just ignored all those comments. What can we do? Well, yeah, I have hope. Put yourself in the shoes of... Uh, a senior executive at one of these ISPs staring at this multi-dimensional chessboard and trying to develop your business plan and decide how you're going to go forward yeah. when there's so much legal uncertainty about what you can and cannot do. Does that so, explain AT&T asking, taking out these big full page ads, asking for uh, Congress to pass a law? Is that what they want? They want clarity? Yeah, that would certainly be helpful. And it's not, you know, I mean, AT&T wants it. I think probably everybody wants right. Congress to come in because the the part you were talking about, does the FCC have authority and under what provisions does the FCC have authority? That's all uh, trying to thread a very small needle there because Congress hasn't acted. So if Congress acted, then we'd right. know exactly uh, what the rules were and, and we didn't have to re uh, rely on uh, what authority a small federal agency has. So, so ladies and gentlemen, it's, got, it's up to you. That means it's up to us because guess who elects mm -hmm. Congress? And call your member of Congress, yep. tell them it's important. And I think we're already seeing in polls that net neutrality, I would never have thought this, but that net neutrality is in fact a hot button issue for a lot of voters. And coming into the 2018 midterm elections, this will be absolutely one of the issues voters will make a decision on. And, and if you care about it, this is your chance uh, to influence it. The election isn't far off. And uh, the time is now to write and call your member of Congress and of yep. course to vote in November. 83% of voters support 
net neutrality. 83%. So that seems like we should be able to get this thing done. Yes, please. Uh, we're changing. <laughs> we need internet. We, <laughs> we need, need open internet. and free internet. Just stay neutral. That's Less where that's where we got what got us to where we are. That's why we have Twit. We wouldn't have Twit without a free and open it's internet. It's true. If you're looking for an issue that mobilizes young voters too, this is it. Yeah, they understand. Yeah. Well, I hope they, they understand. Do. Well, they're our lives, again, are built on <laughs> constant Denise Howell, connectivity. host of This Week in Law Fridays right here on the Twit Network. Thank you so much for joining us. It's always great to see you. Thank you. Love being on the new screensavers. Yay. Thank you, Denise. Yay. All right. Take oh, care. we got some more fun coming up in just a bit. We're going to go uh, deforest the jungle without taking down a single leaf. We're going to get the trees out of the way and see what's no down there. No leaves were there. harmed. This is actually kind of amazing technology. But first, a word from our sponsor... Hover.com. So many people, I think about you, we were talking about AOL. You know, yes. You had an AOL address. You probably aren't, oh, that flow at AOL.com no, anymore. No, no. No, and if, and if you're a business, you really need to be, you shouldn't be at AOL.com or Gmail.com or Hotmail.com. You should be at yourbusinessname.com. Having your own domain name is really important for individuals too. You know, I talk to people all the time. I talk to somebody... Last week on the radio show, who's still on, she said, I still use the MSN butterfly. And I, <laughs> and I said, well, it's time to stop that. <clears throat> and I said, you know, the best thing to do and I, is just for 10 bucks a year, get a domain name that's yours. That's your personal name. You can have hover forward your email from that domain name. That's what I do. All my email comes to leoville.com. And then I tell Hover, yes, yeah, send that over to my email provider. No one has to know uh, when I change email providers, which I do frequently, it happens automatically. My email address doesn't change. If you're a business, what do you, do you want people to be emailing you at hotmail.com? Come on. When I see that, I think this person is not serious about their business. Building your online brand is absolutely important. And it starts with your domain name and it starts at hover.com. The best in class customer support when you buy a domain name at hover.com and not only costs you less, they don't upsell you. You don't have a hundred check boxes, 18 pages of stuff. Oh, would you like this? Would you like that? Man, man, man. All they do, all they do is domain email, domain registration, and domain privacy, which they build in for free. If you go to hover.com slash twit, you can get 10% off your first purchase. That means for one domain or 100 domains. So, you know, you I do this. You buy all the domains that are related uh, to your network. If you do have a website at any one of the big places, Hover has a simple feature. It's called Hover Connect. that lets you connect your domain name to just pretty much any website builder. It's very easy to set up email through hover very inexpensive and man do they have names 400 domain extensions to choose from lately we've been playing with the dot me flow dot me wouldn't that be good <laughs> flow dot me i'm telling you me dot me is a unique extension to use for your portfolio to showcase who you are what you do uh see is flow dot me available Oh, make an offer flow's already got make it. an offer but don't worry you Whoa. can still get flow dot online flow dot desi I don't know what that is. Flow.Democrat, Flow.Republican. <laughs> Go on and on. Flow.Attorney, Flow.CEO. Oh, that's the one. Flow.Camp, Flow.NGO, Flow.Domains, Flow.Hosting. Ooh, Flow.Audio. That flows. Flow.Camera, Flow.Band, Flow.Movie, Flow.Bet, Flow.Bingo, Flow.Cards. I can go on and on. In fact, I will go on and on if you don't stop me. Flowski. Flowski. Flow.Ski. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Flowski. Why not? Flowski. 10% off right now and when you go to hover.com slash twit. I have so many domain names. I have one. I'm reserving. Someday. It's the best name. I'm going to use it. Someday. But you just keep it at hover.com. It's inexpensive. It's good to have. Hover.com slash twit. No upsell. The best support in the nation. Just the features you need. Hover.com slash twit to get 10% off any domain name right now. We love Hover. You will, too. We thank Hover so much for their support. That's where twit.tv is registered. That's where techguylabs.com is registered. That's where leolaport.com.blog. I got a lot of Leo Laports. It's all registered there. Now, ooh, I'm so excited about Me this. Me, too. You may have seen this on National Geographic, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the BBC. If you watch a lot of German TV, who doesn't? All the time. You might, you might, <laughs> a huge story. Joining us via Skype, Professor Thomas Garrison from Ithaca College. He's an archaeologist and 
and I want this title, a National Geographic Explorer. Do you, get a, cool. do you get a special hat with that? You know, I got to admit, uh, I didn't know I was a National Geographic Explorer <laughs> and I saw, until I saw that in the article. It's uh, official. <laughs> well, I, I've, uh, I've received some generous grants from them in the past, uh, but I didn't know that you held that title for life. I thought it was just uh, oh, yeah. while you had the oh, money yeah. from them. So, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, ha I'm happy to bear it and, and very proud to have uh, the association with that organization. It's kind of like being a, a member of the Explorers Club. In the, in yes, the 19th yes. century, right? You, just, you should at least get a special pith helmet, I think. You know, so, I think I have a little lapel pin I'm supposed to wear at conferences. Okay. Right. Pith helmet. I'm just, I'm just saying, get the pith helmet. Uh, so you, you, tell us about archaeology. Did you, did you, was this something, I feel like this was something I loved as a kid. Did, was, were, was that how you got into this, Thomas? For sure. And, you know, uh, that's what most people tell me when I, I meet them. You know, they say, oh, I, I always wanted to do that. Yeah. I say, oh, well, I did. Um, and, yeah, uh, I, certainly. Uh, I fell in love with it as a, as a kid. Um, I actually grew up in a house that was built in 1720 outside of Boston. And in my mom's garden, I used to find old nails and mm -hmm. horsehair wow. plaster and yep. collect them. Those square nails, because uh, that's all the blacksmiths could do. I, live, yeah. I grew up in Pretty Providence neat. in a house built in 1806. Sure. Same yeah. thing. It, Old bottles. Exactly, exactly. And then um, then when I was in college, I, I did a, a study abroad experience down to Mexico and then uh, went straight to do my first field work in Belize. And when I came back from that seven month trip i was pretty much sold on archaeology as a career and specifically on on studying the the maya i remember reading the story of hiram bingham and machu picchu of course he was the explorer in the 1900s early 1900s who found machu picchu even though everybody knew about it all along mm -hmm. but he was the first white guy to find it right uh but but at the time, and I and the, watched the movie. Did you see the movie The Lost City of Z? At no. that time period, people knew there was stuff in the jungle, but they just really there was. It was so hard to get to, so hard yeah. to find. The Inca Trail is is overgrown in many areas. So this is an interesting idea to use technology to look beneath the canopy and into the jungle. Yeah, um, you know, this is, uh, we call it remote sensing technology. It's sort of an umbrella term. And uh, when I started in graduate school, um, I began collaborating with a couple of guys at NASA at the Marshall Sp wow. Space and Flight Center. Uh, NASA actually had a staff archaeologist at the time, this guy Tom Seaver, who, who was a, a great mentor to me. And uh, we started trying to find discolorations in in the trees using sort of infrared combinations of, of different color satellite images to see if we could find um, vegetation changes where Maya ruins grew. Oh, interesting. And, and we, it, it worked okay. So uh, we would trek around and some days we'd get somewhere and find something cool and some days we'd trek all day and find nothing. So... Um, you know, the, I think one of the things that people think when they see this uh, technology uh, to find ruins, they think it's these guys sitting around in, in a lab and from afar trying to find these places. But the reality is that the, the people that are most obsessed with this are the people that have spent their lives slogging around that terrain and just desperately want something to give them a little guidance and make it a little easier for us. Are there, do you think there are a lot of ruins that are undiscovered that are just hidden? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, the, the ancient Maya are in southern Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, Belize, Honduras. But the, the real heart of that civilization is in northern Guatemala, where the country's done a very good uh, job of creating the Maya Biosphere Reserve, which actually preserves the largest stretch of, of jungle in that part of Central America. And so uh, more than any other country in that area, I think we have the most ruins to discover in northern Guatemala. Hmm. Now, does this sort of technology make it easier on actually, you know, going and finding where to dig? Does this make the process faster for you guys? Does it make it so that, you know, maybe you could just jump in and, and do your work for a couple of weeks versus maybe months? Like, I'm very curious how much of a time saver and a money saver this might, this sort of technology might be. Well, it's a, it's a, 
money saver and, and time saver in the sense that we no longer have to uh, spend our time mapping. So mm -hmm. uh, where I work, uh, the site of El Zotes, which is uh, just west of the image that you're showing there, um, we spent uh, about eight years uh, of our field seasons trying to do a really detailed map of that city. And in that combined time, let's say going about a, a month a year, so eight months of work, we probably did about, um, you know, three quarters of a square mile or something like that. And that probably cost us over a hundred thousand dollars over, over the, the time that we did it and LIDAR, you know, one flight and you get, uh, so much more than that. And it does it better than we do. Amazing. So it, LIDAR is very, very humbling to, uh, those of us that try to try to document these ruins because it, it just does it so quickly. So to answer your question, um, yeah, it, it reveals everything to us, which lets us start to uh, ask new questions and approach the archaeology in a new way. What it doesn't make easier is, you know, you still got to walk out there and and get to the place just because you can see it right. doesn't mean there's oh, doesn't yeah. mean there's a road to it. So, um, yeah, it, it's just that we have more direction and we know at the end of every day we're going to find something. Wow, I mean, this is an example of the jungle you have to cut through, and this is an example. Tell me how, of how the LiDAR sees it. Tell me how the LiDAR works. Is a plane flying over? Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a sensor that's mounted onto a, a plane, and it's a laser technology. It stands for light detection and ranging. There you go. And uh, it's connected to some base stations and also to, to GPS satellites, so you get very accurate readings. And as it shoots its uh, laser beams down, every time one of the lasers meets a point of resistance, it gives you a, a 3D coordinate. So uh, in the end, you get this big point cloud, much as you would if you were doing some sort of uh, laser scanning or something now uh, of an object or, or something like that. And so um, what you can do then is pass all that data through a computer and the computer will determine what the lowest point in a sequence is. Basically, what is the point that reached the ground? Mm. And you might say, well, it's the jungle. How does it get to the ground? The density of the points that are shot per second is so great that some of them are going to get through those tiny, tiny holes in the leaves. Wow. But in the end, we throw out, you know, 95% of this data uh, and just keep the ones that get to the ground. And that's what lets us create these uh, amazing images of what's underneath. So it's not x-ray. You're not seeing through the canopy. You're actually just yeah. managing to peek through a little tiny gap yeah. in the leaves it's, and the trees. It's pure brute force of laser technology. Wow. Uh, it's uh, some of them eventually sneaking to, through. So, yeah, it's billions and billions of points. Now, how big is the area that you're scanning? Yeah. Well, that's what's really special about uh, this particular project. Um, LIDAR has been done in the Maya area before, which is how we got the idea for it. But when we approached uh, the Pakunam Foundation, this, this uh, group of philanthropists in Guatemala, uh, we said, hey, this would make a really big impact here in this country. And they, they went all in and they said, well, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it big. And so this survey is 2,100 square kilometers, Holy which cow. is more than double the uh, largest survey that had been, on, been done previously for this, for, for archeology. span So uh, that was really what, what was the game changer was not just seeing these sites that we kind of knew about, but seeing all the spaces in between, and then also seeing these broad trends um, across the region as a whole. How old are these ruins you're seeing? Well, that's, uh, you know, it's a good question because they're definitely ancient Maya, but what we're talking about is, you know, almost 3,000 years of yeah. history compressed into these images. So yeah. we're seeing the totality of that ancient occupation. So one of the things that's going to be our jobs moving forward is how are we going to sort out, you know, what was occupied first, mm. what was occupied at the height of it and what was occupied in in later periods but most of it probably dates to what we call the maya classic period which is about uh ad 250 to 900. Mm -hmm. it's so amazing to see these images did you know that these things were there so um some of the images that you're looking at there you know where you see those uh 
big, big uh, complexes, you know, th those are places that we, we knew about. And the images that we've been showing, a lot of them are, are highlighting places where we're actively doing excavations. Right. And by we, I mean this large consortium of multiple archaeological projects that have somehow managed to uh, collaborate and get together on this and start talking with one another. So that's another uh, great thing about this. Um, yeah, and so there's a, a mix in here of things that we did sort of know about and then expanding outward going into the unknown. And, you know, that's what's really exciting. And, of course, the most interesting stuff is always right on the very, very edge of the data where, where you want to see more. Yeah, of course it is. But it's an amazing thing that the, the government of Guatemala, that the Pakenham Foundation, uh, that these disparate archaeological groups are all cooperating to map this 2100 kilometer uh, area. That's got to be unprecedented. Yeah, and I, you know, I think it's because um, you know, the foundation in terms of its goals and the Guatemalan government in terms of its goals see the benefit of this, um, not just because it's really cool for us archaeologists, but uh, when you're talking about Guatemala, you know, your archaeological tourism, that that's big industry oh, down yeah. there. You know, yeah. when you get off the you get off the plane, uh, every beer ad you see has got a pyramid in it, you know? And so um, this is a way to sort of catalog the cultural resources that they have and let them know sort of what they're, what they're dealing with because looting is still a, a rampant yeah. problem. You know, we're saying we discovered all this stuff uh, using this technology, but the fact is uh, when we look at it really closely, we can actually see the damage done by looters. Oh, wow. um, so new to us but not not new to some people yeah when we were at, we were in Machu Picchu last year at uh, second time there it's an amazing thing in Peru and the Peruvian government clearly knows this is a massive uh, benefit to them in fact unfortunately uh, the amount of tourism in Machu Picchu has kind of gotten out of control yeah There's a lot of yeah. people it's happening there. all over and I and do you worry a little bit that discovering these will kind of make them suddenly subject to uh, overrun mm -hmm. by tourists well, you know, it's interesting. I, I think the, the best example of that in the Maya world would probably be uh, Chichen Itza, Chichen, Chichen which is, uh, yeah. you know, receives all that traffic from Cancun. Yep. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, the you know, these buildings, pyramids and things like that weren't built for millions of people to traipse over. They were pretty exclusive uh, structures. And, you know, the, the Mexican government has basically prohibited people from climbing on these structures and left the big open spaces for, for people to walk around and, and observe them. I think one of the reasons people like to go to Guatemala um, is because the ruins are, you know, they're sort of feral. They're still yeah. in yeah. that in that jungle environment. Yeah. And people like the idea of the, the mysterious Maya, this lost yes. civilization. And, uh, you know, we just want to be clear that um, they're still very mysterious. They're just mysterious in a new way to us. Um, uh, we still have to go to the field and, and do all this stuff, and there, there's still a ton of stuff we don't know. In fact, it's almost like we're looking at them for the first time again. So uh, everyone should should not get too worried. They're still kind of a, a, a confusing uh, civilization that we need to research and understand. You can also do an augmented reality walk through this. You could. Uh, I think National yeah. Geographic yeah. has uh, has an AR video of this. Yeah, yeah. So you know, uh, all of this that you're you're seeing right now is, is part of a, a promotion for uh, a documentary that will be airing on the National Geographic channel uh, on February sixth, nine p.m. Eastern. Oh, that's so uh, oh good. That's going to highlight. It's going to highlight a lot of this work and also um, some of the actual on-the-ground archaeology. It sort of combines the, the things that we dig up and uh, the, this broader project that, that a bunch of us have been working on. And so, I, you know, I think it's going to be uh, really entertaining and, and hopefully bring good positive exposure to the Maya, none of this uh, ancient alien stuff. <laughs>
Oh, I mean, you you know, it's. Uh... <laughs> who was that? That guy who wrote all those books yeah. about? Yeah, the, yeah, that's kind of. Oh sad. yeah, about yeah. Danikin. Yeah, yeah. Chariot yeah. of the Gods. Yeah, yeah, Chariot of the Gods. That's it. Are there other um, archaeological digs around the world that are using this sort of technology? I'm really curious if this is like an up and coming thing that's being used in the archaeological community to help just find other parts of the world. I'm, I imagine. What about like using this in Antarctica to see, yeah. you know, how the glaciers are doing well it, it's funny you mentioned that that's one of the other uh major lidar projects of the the outfit out of the university of houston that did ours they did a lot of lidar down there in antarctica for exactly that purpose yeah. uh, the the best archaeology example of this has actually been at angkor wat uh in cambodia where they've been mm. doing it for for quite a while uh that's kind of the the model that got us thinking about this in the Maya area. Um, I think that the next frontier is probably going to be to do the, the Amazon because with deforestation in the early 2000s, they started seeing these earthworks of some, you know, lost group that we didn't Clearly really know existed. Brush. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> someone was mentioning Lost City of Z. Yeah. Uh, you, you wonder, you know, that's sort of the, the last great frontier. Um, so LIDAR is used... Um, you know, they did it over Stonehenge. They've mm -hmm. done it on the Tara Plain in Ireland. They've done it to look at colonial New England stuff. But it really has its its greatest impact in these areas where it's really hard to get around and see things. The jungle has swallowed it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is so cool. I, you've got a great uh, job, uh, Thomas. I know you, you've been kind of stuck at home. Are you going to go back this summer and uh, spend some more time? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, this is usually a, about the time of year where I start to get the itch uh, <laughs> to go back. Um, you know, it's pretty grueling work. You, uh, you know, you got your your bug bites and your heat yeah. and everything you got to deal with. And by the end of one of the seasons, you're you're kind of tired and exhausted. But you you go through this annual cycle. And yeah. uh, you know, back here, I, I lived in. Uh, Los Angeles the last five years and I just moved back to the Northeast and I'm experiencing this icy winter. Oh my God, here. yeah, Ithaca is freezing. <laughs> yeah, so I am, uh, you know, I'm, I'm watching the video you're putting up there and, and thinking about being Jungle. back down there. Yeah. Thomas, such a pleasure to talk to you and what an exciting project uh, this is. So February 6th is the National Geographic Special. Uh, what's yes. it, what's that going to be called so we can find it? It is called Lost Treasures of the Snake King, which I think uh, maybe do? doesn't sound DVRs. much. <laughs> Lost, but, yeah. yeah. Search for Snake King. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know what? Some, I think NASA learned this, that if you're going to popularize this hard science, you've got to make it accessible and fun. And National yeah. Geographic obviously knows that as well. Um, yeah, we, we definitely feel that responsibility. We want people to know that the real science is exciting and yeah. it doesn't have to be uh, sensationalized uh, beyond what we're actually it's not, doing. It does not have yeah. to be charity of the gods. It's still pretty darn interesting. Wow, I can't wait. Well, I look forward to going down to Guatemala on my next uh, on my next Come see expedition. Us. Yeah, I'd love to see it. Uh, thank you, Thomas Garrison. He's a professor at the uh, Ithaca, Ithaca College. He studies archaeology, National Geographic explorer, and one of the people who helped map the Guatemalan forest using. LIDAR. Thank you, Professor Garrison. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Hey, it's a big birthday coming up. Oh, this yeah. This is amazing. I didn't realize this. Open source is 20. Seem 20? Pretty soon it can drink. I was going to make the exact same joke, <laughs> but you made it before me, so I'll let you have that. <laughs> coming up, we're going to go to Brussels, where the big uh, open source conference, FOSDEM, is going on. Simon Phipps will join us, our good friend. But first, Megan Maroney has uh, an interesting review of keyboards for your iPad. Watch. Earlier this week, we learned that Apple might be coming out with new laptops, but not until September. So those of us entrenched in the Apple ecosystem are faced once again with the question, do I need a laptop or can I get by using an iPad? It's really a personal choice. But if you are going to replace your laptop with an iPad, you're gonna have to start by finding a keyboard that you love. I will show you what I use, plus my recommendations for people who don't need another device to charge, another recommendation for you cheapskates out there, and another recommendation for those of you channeling your inner writer. Here is my keyboard stand of choice, which is really two products in one. The Colorware Magic Keyboard 
and the canopy from Studio Neat. I love Colorware's products because they add flair to what would otherwise be a boring tool. Apple's wireless magic keyboard, which you can buy for $99, is fine on its own. But if you use it every day and you want to stand out from the crowd, you can pay $199 for the keyboard plus a custom finish in the color of your choice. I chose Formula Red in gloss to match the lightning speed of my typing. It is also available in matte. The Canopy from Studio Neat is a stylish keyboard case made of synthetic canvas on the outside and microfiber on the inside. It has a leather strap and a stainless steel snap. Micro suction pads hold the keyboard in place. Before I got the Colorware keyboard, I used this with my standard Magic Keyboard, which was easy to remove and replace with something else. You can use the Studio Neat Canopy with any size iPad or iPhone, and I am a big fan of it because I like buying products from small companies who care about design, and Studio Neat fits the bill. Tom and Dan are their only employees. The Canopy costs $40. If you don't love the idea of pairing a keyboard and remembering to charge it, you really have only two good options. The Apple Smart Keyboard Case, which costs $159 for the 10.5 iPad, and the Slim Combo from Logitech. Both are fine, but boring, in my opinion. The Apple Keyboard Case only comes in gray, even though the other iPad cases without the keyboard come in pink, taupe, fuchsia, saddle brown, and even product red. The Slim Combo from Logitech comes in black or navy, but like the Logitech keyboard cases before it, it feels a little too industrial for me. Bonus points is that it comes with an Apple Pencil case, though. The Logitech Slim Combo starts at $129 and goes up to $149, depending on the size of your iPad. Now, what if your biggest concern is price and you already have a stand and a case? You might want to try the Anchor Ultra Compact Slim Profile Wireless Bluetooth Keyboard for only $23.99. The Anchor Keyboard is compact but sturdy. It won't slide around like those other cheap keyboards you might have tried. It paired easily and includes all the keys you need for your iPad. The battery life is pretty amazing, too. If you use it for two hours nonstop every day, it claims to last up to six months. I would not recommend that you go on Amazon and just pick out any free keyboard case combo because most of them are garbage. That's how I found this Moco keyboard case and stand that was only $28.99. I like the design and they have many more different styles and patterns. It pairs easily, has a Siri key and some other function buttons, but my hand hurt after typing on the keyboard for a while. The company promises that the iPad will go to sleep when you close the case, like the Apple case, but it did not. What's worse is that the stand is a bit wonky. And finally, the winner for style. Long, long ago in a brick house far away, Twit hosted a show called I'd Fun That. Inventors with Kickstarter campaigns presented their ideas to Leo, Lisa, and Mike Elgin, and then the judges decided I'd fund that or go fund yourself. On the second episode of this show, we featured Brian Min of Quirky Writer, a typewriter-inspired mechanical keyboard that you can connect to your computer with a wired connection or that you can connect via Bluetooth to a phone or tablet. Leo ultimately decided not to fund the Quirky Writer, but Brian created one anyway, and now the company, Quirky Toys, is on the second version of the Quirky Writer S. They sent us one for review, and I was very impressed. Here are the specs. The Quirky Writer S offers wireless Bluetooth connectivity for up to three separate devices, as well as wired USB support and a macro programmable aluminum return bar. The side dials that you used to use to roll in and out the paper on an old typewriter now offer mouse scroll functions and volume. Along with being an excellent keyboard for those in love with the feel of a typewriter, the Quirky Writer S looks good in your living room or on display or wherever you leave it, unlike some of the rest of these suggestions. If you want to spend $300 on a keyboard for your iPad, iPhone, or computer and a decorative stand for your iPad, this is one for you. There you have it, my friends. What iPad keyboard do you love? Send me an email at megan at twit.tv or find me on Twitter. I am at Megan Murphy. Hey, Simon, thank you for joining us. I know it's the middle of the night. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm in Brussels in Belgium. Uh, I've been uh, giving the keynote at the great big open source conference, FOSDEM. How exciting. Uh, here in Brussels. How and I've, then I've been out celebrating with all of the elderly open source people. <laughs> <laughs> the last time you were on with us, it was New Year's Eve. You were up equally late. Oh, yeah. Reading poetry, as I remember. Well, he also, he also Absolutely. Well, I, I, 
that's not what I'm going to do this evening. No uh, Jabberwocky tonight. I got tonight. summoned by, by uh, Alex from uh, an otherwise very promising wine evening <laughs> to, to come and see you this evening. So. Well, we're very grateful. So there's actually a birthday party going on for open source tonight? There's a lot of people celebrating open source here. So I gave the keynote this morning. I explained to them that, uh, that the, the free software movement is 35 years old this year. And the idea of open source was first coined uh, in the VA Linux offices in Mountain View on February 3rd, 1998. So it's exactly 20 wow. years old today. Wow. Yeah, see, when I saw the headline 20 years old, I thought, wait a minute, we've had, we've had uh, free software for longer than that. Um, so Absolutely. But, but Bruce Parent conveniently clarified recently, it turns out that open source was intended as a marketing program for free software. So yeah, free software oh. had already been around 15 years by the time the term open source was coined. That's but funny. people noticed that businesses were not using it for their work. Ah. And open source was intended way to get businesses to feel comfortable using free software. Yeah. And it worked tremendously. It, I mean, it's even led to things like, you know, Twit TV happening. Because uh, you've got a load of free software in your, in your business. And it's there at the heart of Google. It's there at the heart of Facebook. Yeah. It's driving the revenue for companies like IBM and now even today Microsoft. So, uh, yeah, the 20th birthday is a celebration of a marketing program that succeeded. It is really amazing. And actually, you, when you say the word Microsoft, hell literally, well, didn't literally, but close to froze over last year when Microsoft announced that it was going to put make Linux available on Azure and it was going to embrace mm -hmm. open source. This was a hated, hated rivalry 20 years ago. Yes. But they really didn't have a choice because they, they've taken a strategic decision to make their company move towards cloud-based offerings like right. Office 365. And if you're going to do that, you've really got no choice but to run open source and free software because all the best software for doing scalable cloud solutions is open source. Yeah. And so Microsoft decided that if they were going to pursue that strategy, they were going to have to make their peace with what they had previously considered to be the devil. Well, and me... so uh, there, they, there they are saying they love Linux. Now, you have to be clear, they are still uh, pursuing companies for patent royalty on embedded Linux. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They are still LibreOffice and uh, desktop Linux with local authorities and governments around the world. But they do love Linux in the cloud, and one hopes that the love will spread to the rest of the company. Well, as you were, I mean, rightly pointed out, everybody who uses Android, uses Linux, yep. uses open source software every day. Every time you surf the web, more chances, are more likely than not, you're yep. using open source. So in a way, really, this is not just the 20th anniversary of the OSI. This is, this is a victory party you're having today. I think that it is. You know, I gave it, the keynote that I gave this morning was about the uh, start of the third decade of open source. And at the start of the third decade, Really, uh, open source has become the dominant way of doing software in the enterprise. Uh, open source is running the internet. Open source is essential for the new technologies that happen. You can't do IoT without open source. Yeah, you can't true. do cloud without open source. And so really the big questions are, well, how is it going to cope with all of this influx of uh, corporate interest? And I think the interesting questions are how the communities cope with the corporations coming in and being their friends. Yeah. What are the challenges open source faces going into its third decade? Uh, I think one of the challenges that it faces is the challenge of uh, scaling up. A, a lot of the new projects are happening in trade associations like the Linux mm -hmm. Foundation and like OpenStack. And those organizations uh, sell membership. And uh, like any organization that sells membership, they give more favors to the people who pay more. And yeah. uh, there are still a lot of individuals and small businesses involved in open source projects. And finding a balance between the corporate dynamic and the presence of very important individual contributors and small businesses, I think is going to be a real challenge for the open source movement. It's interesting. Here we are. Uh, lately, there's even been calls for Intel, but thanks to the Meltdown Inspector, uh, to open source its, its microcode, that maybe, maybe even hardware needs to be open source as well as software. I think it's more, well, a lot of hardware is being open sourced. Uh, the, the situation with Intel is more complex because they're already using open source. You know that the controller that is sitting inside every chip 
uh, ring minus one and ring minus three, already running Minix under an open That's source right. license. That's right. Yeah. That's the Intel management engine. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, the, you know, the, the real question is less to do with whether they open source all the code and more to do with their overall transparency with their customers right. and with the global community. Because yeah. what else is lurking in those chips? You know, what are we going to discover next month Isn't is running a, a ring minus five. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? Uh, do you find that the interest in open source, that the support for open source, particularly among developers, is, is growing? Uh, I think that we're seeing the open source community continuously growing now. Yeah. So FOSDEM here in Brussels is now at capacity. Nice. Uh, the, 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 we've, it's a huge venue and it can't take any more people. The new growth is with people who are generalists. You know, in, in the last decade of open source, the people who were in the open source community were typically specialists in a particular project or a particular technology. The people who are coming into the world of open source are being asked by their companies to build complete stacks of software, to integrate many open source projects to solve problems. So the growth of the community is more from now from people who are integrating many different projects together. And that means the character of the growth is different. It's now less little isolated pockets to developers and now yeah. big uh, rafts of people who are generalists across many projects. And I think that that is going to lead to more growth and I think it's going to lead to a different character of the open source community in this decade. Simon, I know an open source beer, free as in free beer, is waiting for you. I thank you for taking a little time from FOSDEM. Congratulations. It's a great feeling to know. I mean, a past president of OSI, Bruce Perrins is still there uh, uh, involved and Eric Raymond's still involved in it. I just feel like open source, I think we can finally declare victory. And I think that is fantastic. Congratulations. <laughs> Great thing. Thank you for your congratulations. And I just want to tell all your viewers, they should be watching Floss Weekly on Wednesdays. I agree. It's our open source show, free Libra and open source software. Uh, with our, it has a rotating panel, but of course, Randall Schwartz is the uh, one of the more regular hosts. It was started actually by the guy in charge of open source at Google uh, today, Chris DeBona. So yeah. we're... We're, we're here in, in uh, Fosdem. I, I, I was uh, drinking wine with him last oh, night. Oh, nice. So, uh, That's wonderful. In the industry, too. Simon, always a pleasure to talk to you. We haven't talked to Simon since one of our New Year's Eve shows where he read us the Jabberwocky. And, uh, <laughs> and actually, we just saw it again because we were rerunning it for New Year's. Simon, thank you so much. Congratulations. Happy thank birthday. You Happy birthday. Take care. Simon Phipps, former president of the Open Source Initiative. Uh, he was, uh, we should give him a lot of credit, one of the guys at Sun who was responsible for taking... Solaris open for taking Java open, uh, really have been a, a great advocate for open source software. He's actually literally one of the gray beards <laughs> in the open source movement. Uh, I think it's time now after we celebrate for a call for help. All right, here's our question from Carson, California, Patricia. Hi, Leo, this is my question. I have three different iMac computers. They're all the same type of computer. I have different photos on each one. Some have duplicate photos of the other computer Ugh. on it. Yep. Plus some of them have duplicates on the same computer. I want to combine all the photos into one group or one place so that I can access them easier and basically get rid of any of the duplicates that I have without losing anything along the way i just was trying to figure out the best application or the best way to do that i did not thank you patricia she's recorded obviously she's off to meet Tom, john tesh mm -hmm. but what i didn't know about her do you know what her job is she should be on what's my line you would never guess her job she steams feathers yes for a living yes steams fe for victoria's secret which makes me think she must make the angel wings, right? That they wear on those fashion shows every year. Because I don't, I don't know, I don't buy stuff at Victoria's Secret, but I don't think they sell a lot of feathers. No, unfortunately. I mean, we'd all like to be birds. Fly. <laughs> we'd all like to fly. So Patricia, I guess my advice for you on this would be probably, it's not gonna be free, but <clears throat> it won't be expensive forever, is to turn on iCloud. So Apple has a great feature, iCloud photo sharing. If you create, not, you already have an iCloud account, you might have to pay for additional mm -hmm. storage. I pay two bucks a month for 100 gigabytes. That's probably more than enough, unless you have a lot of photos. If all your photos are in Apple's Photos app, 
go to the settings, turn on iCloud photo sharing and all three of them, Apple's smart enough, it will upload the originals of all those photos from all three Macs, but it's smart enough if it sees the same photo, in most cases it will not upload three different copies, it'll just upload one. If you've modified the photo, it will upload a modified version. <clears throat> and so that's going to give you one central cloud-based storage for your iPhone, your iPad, your, all your Macintoshes. When you turn it on, it will also make sure that each Macintosh has the entire set with, in most cases, no dupes. You can choose when you turn this on in your Macintosh one of two things, either to store the originals on your Mac. You, I'd pick one or two Macs to store the originals on. One's probably enough. And then the rest of them will get downsized JPEGs, just enough to see the photo. And then if you wanted to edit it or you wanted to see the full quality, you wanted to print it or send it off to a photo book, it could get the full quality version from the cloud. So the idea is the full quality versions are stored in the cloud. In most cases, it, there won't be duplicates. There'll be one of each. And one computer should also have a local copy of all the originals. And that's, uh, that's a beautiful setup. You, I would keep that setup. You don't have to, though. Once you've done that, and give it time for everything to upload and collate and download back down to one of those iMacs. If you wanted, you could export now that from that iMac where the original photos are, export that folder and put it anywhere. Now it's been somewhat cleaned up, right? And you could put it on any other service you want, even have it on your own hard drive. And then if you don't want to be paying for the extra storage on iCloud, stop paying. So at most, this is going to cost you a couple of bucks for one month of iCloud 100 gigabytes. Let it all merge together. I think it does a great job. There are third-party apps that do not do as good a job of this. Let iCloud do it. You're already on a Mac. And you can do shared photo albums on iCloud. So it's anything, nice, isn't it? anything that you yeah. want to share with your family. Yeah. What I do, and I bet, you know, I think anybody with a Mac probably does this, is I use iCloud, but I also use Google Photos. I yeah. Right? It's... And because I like Google Photos because then I can search. It has, although iCloud has, uh, Apple, I, Apple's Photos is now starting to do a lot of these same features locally. Some people are private, are concerned about privacy, so they don't want to give it to Google. They want to store it with Apple. But I love the cat. There's Jerry's album. I love the, I could tell because I recognize Derby, his son. Uh, I love the way you could search for Derby and you'd have all of Derby's pictures or you could search for toy cars and you'd have all of the toy car pictures. Or create an album that you can share with the family. Yeah. And I'm sure everybody's got a Gmail. Yeah. Google's easy. great that way. You not yeah. only share the album, but you can share the album in such a way other people can upload to oh, it. Oh, I love that part. And yeah. then make it a slideshow on yep. uh, the Chromecast. Right. And then it also has a feature where you could say, you know, if I take pictures of Lisa because I'm sharing with her, it'll say, you have more pictures. Do you want to share these with Lisa yep. also? On our last trip, it was really easy to share all my photos. Automatically. So uh, I think Google Photos probably has more options, but the trick is to use iCloud to get that one kind of official library, mm -hmm. and then you can do anything you want, including putting it on Google Photos. That's so nice that Apple goes through all that for you. I know, I think isn't you still it? have to kindly manually do it on Google Photos, which as an Android user, can be a bit of a work. Yeah, and I have to say the biggest problem I have with Google Photos is duplication. Yeah, same. So I often will have two or three of the same image. Oh, yeah. I guess they prefer to take it no chances, right? You know, better safe than sorry. Right, right. and <laughs> since they say uh, the storage is unlimited there, all right. Thank you, uh, Patricia. If you want to That's join us next week, Jason Howell will be here. Let's get some Android questions. What do you say? Yeah. Here's how you ask. Need tech help? The new screensavers are here with answers. Email your tech questions to newscreensavers at twit.tv. Mailbag's next. The mailbag's next, but Father Robert Balazer is here with a smartwatch that costs less. He actually, he says, likes it. Watch. Looking for the most advanced smartwatch on the market. Something with more features than a Samsung Gear S3. More style than an Apple Watch. Apps for days? Well, if so then the WeLoop Hey 3S is not the watch for you. This is not the unlimited blade works of wrist candy. This is not an Apple Watch killer. This will not replace your phone. But what it can do is to be an incredibly competent health monitoring device in a watch package with the right price and a battery life that may shock you. The Hey 3S is a multi-sport smartwatch with a 1.28 inch touchscreen under Corning G3 glass. It's light. And when I say light, I mean really light. A Samsung Gear S3 is 60 grams. An Apple Watch can be up to 125 grams, but the Hey 3S tops out at 38 grams. 
It uses low-power Bluetooth 4.2 to connect to your iOS or Android-compatible phone and is equipped with the full set of sensors that you would expect from a health monitoring device. GPS and GLONASS positioning, an optical heart rate sensor, compass, gyroscope, 3-axis accelerometer, and 9-axis IMU. All of that means that it can track steps, cycles, distance, speed, heart rate, and sleep patterns. It's also IP67 rated so that you can use it while showering, swimming, snorkeling, and diving down to 30 meters. Beyond the multi-sport features, the Hey 3S gives you a basic smartwatch functionality. Linked to your phone, you can choose to receive notifications from most of your apps and data is synced periodically, meaning that you don't have to have your phone with you at all times. There's a decent selection of watch faces, though the watch can only hold one alternate face at a time, and syncing over BLE is a slow process. The 1.28-inch touchscreen is responsive, but then again, there's not much to the UI. A few rudimentary icons let you access the various sensors of the watch, set up lap times, timers, and the like, but it's not exactly overwhelming, and it's definitely not beautiful. But then again, it's not supposed to be. You see, the Hey 3S isn't a small phone on your wrist. It really is a watch that just happens to have some smartwatch features. For that downgrade of smartwatch functionality, you get three things. First, price. At $150, the Hey 3S is half to a third of what you would pay for a premium Apple or Android watch. Second, size and reliability. Being so low powered, WeLoop was able to make the Hey 3S ultra light and durable. And third, battery. You might be able to squeeze two days out of an Apple Watch, maybe five to six days out of a Samsung Gear S3, but the 270 milliamp hour battery in the Hey 3S will last you a month. No, that's not a typo, a full month. In fact, I haven't charged this review unit since it was first seen on our CES episode of New Screensavers on January 13th. That was three weeks ago, and since then I've traveled around the world and walked a few miles through the halls and corridors of Rome. Even then, the watch still has more than 50% battery power remaining. It surprises me to say this, but I actually like the Wii Loop Hey 3S, and I'll probably end up wearing this thing. Now, if you already have an Apple Watch or an Android Watch, this is definitely a step back in terms of functionality, but that's the point. It gives you what you need in a smartwatch with nothing that you don't. Uh, it's definitely not a gadgeteer's watch, so if you're looking for a toy, something to fidget with, you may want to stick with what you already have. But if you're like me and you don't normally wear a watch, or if you're looking for something that doesn't cost hundreds upon hundreds of dollars, something that's small, something that's light, and something that has an ungodly battery, then maybe the WeLoop Hey 3S is the way to get you into wearing a smartwatch. I'm Father Robert Palliser, the Digital Jesuit, reporting mm -hmm. for Twit TV. Thank you, Father Robert. I, I may be a nice watch. I like the battery life, but I'm not going to wear something called the WeLoop Hey S. Seems to work better than Android Wear. Strange name. So. <laughs> what, what is the state of... I noticed you're not wearing an Android Wear. No. Oh, you gave it to Megan. You let it to Megan. I gave Megan a couple watches for the yeah. six-week trial, yes. Six-week switch. Are you are you kind of over Android Wear? Did well, you ever... I, no, I just... I'm not into the styles. Yeah. I don't want a heavy watch. They're clunky. They're, They're very really clunky. clunky. Even the Apple Watch, frankly, is kind of clunky. Uh, they make a 38 millimeter, which is a little bit better for... for but people will still wear that to a wedding. I've seen a lot of beautiful... Really? You know, people brides? dress up for weddings, like, not well, brides. not brides, no. but I've, you know, a lot of wedding guests. You can still pair it with your nice dress. I, I, ha I hate it because, <laughs> no, I hate it because I, I, I use it now. And the problem with it is, okay, so now you start using this, and I've found a few applications that I really can't live without. You start using this, and that means, oh, well, now I need to use my iPhone. I can't use my Pixel right. 2, which I love. That's how they get you. So then now that I'm using the iPhone, I have to use the iPad. Now that I'm using the iPad, I have to use the Macintosh. Now that I'm using the and Macintosh. And this is why Apple has so much money. This is exactly why Apple I, has so much money. I even ordered, and we'll have it for next week's new screensavers, the new HomePod. You know what we're going to do? We're going to do, a, it comes on Friday, we're going to do a, t a sound test, we're blind. We're going to make people put on blindfolds. We're going to compare it to the Google Home Max, the big one. I'm so excited. Compare it to the Sonos One, which right. you can get two for the price of one home. With HomePod, Alexa built in. With a, a, Amazon's Echo built in. We're going to compare it to a bunch of different speakers, but we'll do it blind, blindfold, so people can, you know, without any bias, tell us which one sounds amazing. better. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it, it, they keep sucking going crazy makes me crazy i don't it's why they have so much money it is it's true i have to say one thing though i'm gonna say one thing whether it's amazon echo google home apple's new home pod 
uh, these these devices are great for podcasts. Yep. More and more people are saying, well, in the case of Echo, Echo, tune in the new screen, mm -hmm. listen to the new screensavers on TuneIn, mm -hmm. or on uh, Google Home, listen to the new screensavers, or on the HomePod, any, any podcast that's on the iTunes store, which is every podcast, you could just ask for by name. And I think finally, one of the things I thought for years was holding podcasts back was that you had to kind of know how to do it, right, find it, right. subscribe to it, yeah, download it, listen true. to it. The advent of podcast apps on phones has helped, but this makes it even better. It means that you're walking around the house, you can be listening to podcasts all the time. Quick tip, the Google Home, you can actually cast just audio while you have video on your computer. So what I do is I'll listen to some of my reality TV while I'm washing the dishes, and I'll and have it have stream the into the kitchen. In the room. Well, I have the speaker in the kitchen, and then I have the TV. the TV in the other room, so I cast it that way. That's a great idea. I love it. That's a great idea. I love it. If you, uh, if you haven't yet figured out how to use your voice-activated assistant to listen to our show, we're on every one of them. All you have to do is get the syntax right. Generally, it's listen to whichever show mm -hmm. you'll get the newest episode let's say the new screensavers are on the echo android. devices or all about android let's get <laughs> let's, let's put let's one in fair. there for me listen let's, i'll make that the example listen to all about android uh usually that's sufficient if there's any confusion sometimes i have to add podcast sometimes on uh, echo you'll say on tune in because that's their provider right. but generally once you figure out the syntax it makes it really easy to just always listen to the next episode there's another thing i'd, I'd love you to do which is subscribe to the flash briefing we just expanded uh, the flash briefing in Canada, Australia, United Kingdom, and India. So, in the U.S. or Canada, Australia, United Kingdom, and India, if you have an Amazon Echo device, go into your Echo app on your phone and at, look at the flash briefing section and look for Twit and add us. We do this show, every show, we have a little snippet, two-minute snippet that can be part of your daily news flash briefing. I know you have other news sources, but for your technology news, why don't you add to it? You can hear bits of our show. Uh, again, that is uh, in the U.S., Canada, Australia, the United Kingdom, and India. That's really exciting. Uh, I help Jason news. with that every Tuesday after the show, the flash briefing. Yeah. <laughs> we figure out what's the, like, exactly. we'll figure out what the best little two-minute snippet yeah. is from this show, and uh, you'll be yeah. able to hear it tomorrow morning if you get up and you can say, good morning, Echo, and it'll say, here's your flash briefing. Oh, that's there it the is. most fun part. Turn on Twit. You can have Dig, you can have the Daily, you can have any of that other stuff, but make sure Twit's right in there. Doesn't have to be first, just in there. That's all I ask. <laughs> all right, enough talking. By the way, this is the quirky keyboard. Would you ever, would ever, would you, that's 300 bucks, but it, Yeah, this is aside, something I would buy for somebody I loved who was really into lot. aesthetic. Ooh, but, these are but really, see, but wait these a are minute. nice and. That's what I mean. These are these are Cherry MX Blue, I think. Ooh, that's why they sound so They're nice. They're good switches. They're clicky switches. I think that, I you know, I poo-pooed this when we first saw it. Even, that's a little expensive, but if the price Oops. isn't enough to stop you, it's a very, physically, a very nice keyboard. It and is. Isn't that hysterical? You're too young to remember this. Do you remember? You never used a typewriter, did you? Nope. Oh, my God. Sorry. I, this, Sorry. This is, this is. I am that generation. This is how I grew up, man. Can you imagine? All my college papers are right. Aye. And they were about that good, too. Yeah. Time for the mailbag! Colleen will throw us the mailbag. <laughs> <laughs> and here inside, two massages. Okay. Pick your massage. Let's see. I'm going to pick this one. Okay. If you pick All it, right. you got to answer it. Email this number one. I got it. We Cut. just decided to turn... Oh, wow. Jerry's writing. This is a fun one. This is a good one. You know this one? We just decided to turn the cellular on on our 11-year-old daughter's Galaxy Note 5. It's kind of a special day. You know, when your little girl is growing up, you turn on the cellular. However, she's been a data-burning demon. <laughs> and I was wondering if there's a way to limit apps to only use Wi-Fi as opposed to cellular. I want her to be able to use the specific apps, but want to limit them to work on Wi-Fi only. And then some, you know, like a map maybe, so if she gets lost, she can do that on cellular. Any help will be appreciated. I know you can on the iPhone. It's easy peasy. It's right in there in the iPhone settings. You could say, this one can't use cellular, this one, this one, this one. Can you do it in Android? Yes, you can do that. You can go into the settings and tweak those. Or one app that actually Google put in the Play Store is Date Ally. Like, it's spelled D-A-T-A-L-L-Y. So we think it is pronounced Date Ally and not Data Lee. 
because it's I'm supposed to be like your ally data. for your data. All right. So down. I'm going with that play yeah. on words. Right. I think that's what it's called. Yeah. Um, and that sort of, it gives you analytics on your data usage and oh. both uh, what you're doing with your cellular data, what you're doing with Wi-Fi Can data. Can you control it though? Can you say, turn off the cellular or... You have to do uh, that. In I settings. Yeah, I believe so. I believe you can do it from that app, if I remember the I, way we demoed it. I'm not an 11 year old girl, but I do breeze through data. And when I travel, I will do that. I'll yeah. go through the cellular settings and say, yeah, I don't really need. You know, my horse track race betting form no. to get daily updates no. over Not data. in other country. No. Only when you're local. No. Yeah. You know, in the region. Right. Um, Samsung also has some of these things built in to the settings panel on their specific interface. So you can go in and nice. do a little data saver. And, good. Yeah. And they've got a Samsung, so that's yeah. good. Perfect. She's, she's a lucky girl. I have a Note 5 for a yeah. one year old. That's a nice phone. Yeah. All right. Uh, this one's from an anonymous. Anonymous. Oh. Uh, I've been digging and searching on this question for a long time, and I believe that this issue deserves more attention. Yes. Which is why we're doing it on this show. Which yes. smartphone manufacturers take Android update, oh, updates seriously? Good question. I want to get a new phone, but can't find anyone addressing this aspect. Actually, I will say one person who does address this aspect annually is a uh, pal over at uh, Computer World. Do you know his name? Uh, JR. Oh, JR Raphael. JR Raphael. He yeah. actually uh, every year does an Android report card. And he hasn't done one for this year yet since Oreo's come out, but kind of based on the pattern that we've had over that past couple of years, pretty much the people you can rely on are Google first and foremost. Yep. Any phone that comes from Google Camp that's the Nexus devices, it's Pixel actually devices. Why I buy Google phones because yep. I know I'll be updated at least for Immediately. a few years. Yeah. They're already on Android 8.1. Right. Uh, Samsung is okay. It really depends on the carrier that you're with if they're going to see it. Part of the problem is, unlike the iPhone, where Apple had the clout to say to everybody, "You will update." Yeah. You have to. Google is just one part of the equation. You've got a, a manufacturer and you've got a carrier. All three of them have to do the update, and often the carriers get in the way. There's yep. J.R. Raphael's yep. Android update. So he for hasn't the last done it one. since Nougat. Yeah. Um, but I believe, I'm sure Oreo's coming up. Um, Wasn't there an initiative afoot to get uh, manufacturers to agree to promise? It's So there's two different kinds of upgrades. Yes. There's the big upgrades to the next version of Android. I don't think that's feature upgrade. I don't think that's as important as the monthly security update. And not everybody has, not every manufacturer has agreed to that. That's the key. That's the only key. by phones for people who say yes. We promise you will get the monthly update yeah. as quickly as possible. It'll never be as fast as, quickly as Google. As quickly as possible through the carrier. Right. It will never be as fast as Google. Yeah. Motorola. I think LG is pretty good. Samsung's pretty yeah. good. Motorola. I was going to say Motorola because, uh, especially now that they're part of the Android One program with the X4, uh, Motorola has been playing really a lot nicer with Android Good. in the past couple of years. Good. So, but again, depends on the carrier. Right. Right. So now that uh, Motor, now that Google owns all the HTC engineers who <laughs> did the Pixel, yes, uh, I think you're gonna. That's that's a billion dollar commitment from Google that they're gonna oh, be in the smartphone yes. business. Yes, that's how they're gonna get you to come on board. You they know? saw Apple. They what I just talked about with Apple, mm -hmm. the ecosystem. They saw how well that works for Apple. Yeah, I bet that's what they're gonna do. Who doesn't want billions of dollars yeah. at you know at every quarter? So I think it's it's pretty clear. <laughs> yeah, right. Who doesn't? <laughs> who doesn't? I think it's pretty clear that Android for Google is gonna end up meaning most importantly Google yeah. phones, well, Google hardware. The specs, the hardware is pretty great. I think the pixels now it are is. great. It's the price that stops people, right? So if, if yeah. you want a less expensive phone, maybe Motorola G5 Plus, something like that. Yeah, or even the one I mentioned, the X4, which you can get on Project Fi. It's only 400 bucks, and it's got oh, pretty that's good, a good specs. Price. That's a great phone. It's pretty good for somebody who just wants a, you know, a yeah. good solid phone that isn't super on the. It can do this and that. If but, it's you on know. Fi, they're going to update it, right? Yeah, that's Google's own carrier. Yes, yeah, yes. and Fi is pretty good in the United States, and you yeah. can go overseas Fi. with it. Yep. I also love you, Flo. Thank you for coming and Thank being you, part Leo. of our show. Uh, you are every Tuesday right here in studio, yep. sitting right over there, working hard with Ron Richards and Jason Howell and all about it's Android. True. Tune in about 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern about. on Tuesdays. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> 6. So, hey, it's an evening show. It's Leo time. Nothing's on time. On we have you network. the whole evening. It's not a television <laughs> uh, channel. It's You're watching us make podcasts. We'll get there. And when eat we get Oreos. There.
which yes. we've been doing a lot of this year. I noticed that every time somebody comes in, you get a different flavor. Yeah, but I've taken it on now because Jason's on a no sugar kick. So yeah. What flavor is your favorite so far? Uh oh, it was the hazelnut one. The oh, it was really good. That sounds very good. There's some it's really god hazelnut. awful flavors, like oh, that yeah. mystery flavor. What oh, was terrible. that? Fruit Loops. Fruit. What was that? It was um um. It was Fruity Pebbles. Fruity Pebbles. It was Fruity Pebbles. It really was Fruity Pebbles. Somebody won $50,000 for guessing it was Fruity Pebbles. They should get $50,000 just for eating that many of those. Those were I awful. mean, healthcare in America, you got to have that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all of that Android, lots of fun. Of course, you'll catch Flo's byline all over the place. Where, where do we see most of Flo? I am everywhere now. I, I uh, I'm now I'm writing for review.com slash USA nice. Today, which nice. is awesome. Ooh, that's good. Yeah, I'm doing robo vacuums and DIY security for Tom's Guide. Nice. Um, still doing some Android stuff for PC World from once in a while. But you're becoming an IoT person, kind of a device person, huh? Yeah, I'm venturing in it this year. Nice. I'm still, you know, the Android stuff is still the first love, but... Best place to keep up with her on Twitter, at O... Oh, that flow. That flow. O-H-T-H-A-T-F-L. No W. Oh. No, no W. w. That name. would be a whole different meaning. Was, yes. Thank you, Florence Ion. Thank you, Leo. Always a pleasure. Thank you all for being here. Don't forget, we do this show, and you can watch live... Roughly, we're pretty we're pretty accurate on this one. 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC. You can watch it at twit.tv slash live. If you do, please join us in the chat room. It's our community where everybody gets together and yells at us. IRC. <laughs> no, and also gives us a good input. IRC.twit.tv. IRC.twit.tv. If you can't watch live, all of our shows are available, both audio and video, on demand at the website twit.tv. In this case, twit.tv slash NSS. While you're at twit.tv, it's the, uh, the brand new year, means brand new survey. We do this once a year. We like to get to know you a little bit better, and you can answer just a few questions. It would really help us at twit.tv slash survey. I promise you we are not using your email for anything. We are not gathering information about you individually. This is only to be used uh, as, a, as a whole so we can better understand our audience. Twit.tv slash survey. Thanks for being here. See you next time. On the new screensavers, bye-bye, 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 bye-bye.